Today is day two in our novena in honor of Our Lady of Lourdes and St. Bernadette. I'm here at St. Stephen's Catholic Church in Portland, Oregon, and recalling a wonderful pilgrimage to Lourdes uh, about a year and a half ago in, the, in September of 2019, when it was easy to travel internationally. Well, today we're going to talk about our, the, uh, the second and the third apparitions of Our Lady to St. Bernadette at Lourdes. Now, I want to remind you, if you look at the description below the video, you'll find a copy of the Novena Prayers. You can print this out. If you print it out double-sided uh, and, um, and have it as the, uh, on the binding, have it uh, on, the left so on the left shorthand side, then it should come out uh, perfectly as a book for you. It's a PDF file. Otherwise, you can pick up a copy here in the church and pray that along with us. It includes on the back cover the Hymn of Lourdes, which is not, uh, well, it's not in any hymn book. I think you just have to go to Lourdes to get it, and it's, it's printed on the side of the little paper lantern that you buy at the, uh, at the merchants there for the evening uh, candlelight uh, Eucharistic procession. All right, well, let's get started with the second and the third apparitions. In nomine Patris et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, let us begin with a memorare. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To thee do we come, before thee we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer us. Amen. Nomine Patris et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Now, yesterday we discussed the first apparition, which was very simple. St. Bernadette, for about the length of time of a rosary, knelt in an ecstasy as she beheld the lady with the white gown, the blue sash around her waist, and golden roses on each of her feet. And the lady was also praying along a golden rosary. The lady said nothing, but uh, Bernadette uh, almost went unnoticed by her friends who were gathering uh, bones and sticks for firewood until they came back and found her. And they knew that something was changed Something, she had a calm about her, and she had a vigor and a strength. That uh, This sickly girl had a vigor and strength, and the other girls were tired, and St. Bernadette, you know, picked up what they couldn't carry and, and bounded back home. But along the way, St. Bernadette mentioned to them that she had seen a beautiful lady. And when they got back home, her sister, Toinette, whispered to the mother about this. Well, that's when the trouble started, and that's when the talk started. So when, when Bernadette uh, went back to her school, little by little, the, the girls found out and were talking about it, and they told one of the sisters, one of the nuns, Sister Damien, uh, was um, cautious, but she noted that Bernadette was sincere very calm about it. And she cautioned St. Bernadette to be very careful. Now let's go forward to just a couple days later. So as you recall, the first apparition was on Thursday of Sexagesima week, the Thursday before uh, Ash Wednesday. So now let's go forward to the following Sunday. This is Sunday before Ash Wednesday. This is known to the people there in Lourdes as 40 Hours Sunday. This would begin the 40 Hours Devotion that would end on, on Mardi Gras, on Fat Tuesday, Shrove Tuesday, the day before Ash Wednesday. So uh, the, the tradition here is that faithful Catholics, devout Catholics, pious Catholics would be making, doing adoration for those 40 hours, those, those three days before Ash Wednesday, to make reparation for sins committed by those who partied too much during Mardi Gras. Well, on that Sunday then, 
On that Sunday, now, St. Bernadette had promised her, her parents that she would not return to the grotto, but there was such interest among the people, and um, St. Bernadette herself acknowledged that she wanted to go back. So her friends gathered around her, and in fact, they gathered at the mill and started telling her parents that they needed to let her go, and her mother said no, and they begged, and so her mother said, oh, go ask your father. So they went and asked the father. He said no. But a friend of his said, ah, let her go. And they told her to take holy water. That if this was, her father was afraid this was something evil. And her father's friend said, well, have her take holy water from the church. If it's something evil, then it'll flee. Well, St. Bernadette had mentioned that the lady was fingering a rosary. And so, her father sort of, he didn't necessarily give her permission, but enough that her friends took Bernadette down to the grotto. Now, when they got there, let's see here. When they got there, here we are. There were, uh, this is a description of her friend, uh, Jeannie or, or Jeanne. There were about 20 of us all poor, Oh, this is her sister, Toinette. There were 20 of us, all poor and a little bigger than me. Thus, they were walking in two separate groups, somewhat anxious as to what was going to happen, but not daring to say so, curious only to discover whether or not Bernadette had told the truth. In this way was improvised the very first pilgrimage to the grotto of Massa Biel. So this was the first pilgrimage now. Bernadette, who was leading, went down the zigzags of the slope at an extraordinary speed, but her companions descended slowly, clutching the bushes. When we reached the grotto at the bottom, Toinette continued, she was already on her knees. She made us kneel down and take out our beads. And toward the end of the first decade of the rosary, Bernadette exclaimed, look, a bright light. And then after a moment's silence, she began again in a loud voice, imagining that her companions were favored with the same vision. Look at her, she has a rosary slipped over her right arm. She's looking at us. Well, the girls questioned one another. Not one of them perceived anything. But Bernadette was on her feet again. Bracing her small figure, she took a few paces toward the mysterious being, near enough to touch the eglantine. And she said, if you come from God, then stay. And vigorously she sprinkled the rock with holy water. N not merely did she not go away, but by a smile affirmed that she came from God. And reassured, Bernadette came back and knelt among her companions. Silent, motionless, she kept her eyes fixed intently on the point where she appeared. Marie Hio and her, uh, uh, and her companions had just started another decade of the rosary when a stone fell from the top of Massibiel and before rebounding into the canal, it struck the big boulder against which Bernadette was leaning. She gave a start and then with her hands joined on her, head, on her beads, her head and shoulders stretched forward, her whole face astonishingly pale, but not livid. She remained with her eyes riveted on the niche above La Eglantine. She's dead, cried several of the schoolgirls incapable of recognizing in this suspension of the senses the marvels, the marvel of ecstasy. Well, the girls uh, were afraid that the rock perhaps had hit her. Well, it was her friend, Jeannie, uh, or Jeanne uh, Abadi, who was angry that they had gone on without her, and she had thrown the rock. Well, they couldn't move Bernadette. She, uh, she could not be budged, and she looked like she was dead. But they knew she wasn't dead. So they ran and got uh, one of the boys, Antoine, who was 18 years old and very strong. And they brought him back to see if he could help and take Bernadette out of there because she, she looked like she was dead. And here is Antoine's testimony. Bernadette Subaru, they told me, is at the grotto of Massa Biel. We don't know what she sees. We can't drag her away. Come and help us. Well, bareheaded and without a jacket, I at once followed my mother and aunt and went down by the wretched little path to the grotto. On arriving there, I saw three or four poor girls 
Toinette Soubirou and Bernadette. The latter was on her knees, deathly pale, her eyes wide open and fixed on the niche. She had her hands joined and her beads between her fingers. Tears were streaming from both her eyes. She was smiling, and her face was lovely, lovelier than anything I've ever seen. It made me feel both happy and sad, and all day long my heart was moved at the thought of it. I remained for a time motionless watching her. The girls were watching her like me, and my mother and aunt were also spellbound. In spite of her smile, I was grieved to see her so pale. At length I went up to her, for my mother said to me, Take hold of her, and we'll bring her home with us. I took her by the right arm. She struggled to stay. Her eyes remained fixed upward. Not a murmur. But after the struggles, a somewhat hurried breathing. I lifted her by one arm, and then by the other. My mother took one arm. While lifting her, I wiped her eyes, and I put my hand in front of them to prevent her seeing. I tried also to make her bend her head, but she raised it again and reopened her eyes with the smile. We had great difficulty in getting her to climb the path, my mother holding one hand and I the other, both of us pulling in front and my aunt and the girls following behind. She was trying hard to go down again without, however, saying a word. It took a great effort to drag her along. Strong as I am, it would have been heavy work had I been alone. All the way up, her face, Bernadette's, remained deadly pale and her eyes still wide open and fixed upward. I was sweating when we reached the top. We went down by the wood road as far as the mill, leading the child in the same manner, my mother and I together. Mother questioned her and so did I. She made no answer. I was sad and afraid. Her eyes and her face remained the same as at the grotto. Tears trickled down continuously. I again put my hand now and then in front of her eyes and dried her tears. She never stopped smiling until she reached the mill. As we went in on the, on the very threshold, she lowered her eyes and head, and the color came back to her face. We took her into the kitchen and made her sit down. The girls had come in with us. When she was seated, I said to her, what do you see in that hole? Do you see something not very nice? She said, oh no. I see a very lovely lady. She has a rosary on her arm, and her hands are joined. While saying this, Bernadette pressed the palms of her hands together. Afterward, I went off to town and called on her godmother, Aunt Bernard, who keeps an inn. I told her the whole affair, and she said, Mon Dieu, what can the little one be thinking of going down there? And there is the testimony of Antoine. Now that sets the stage then for the third apparition. Now at the third apparition, um, her mother of course and her father are very troubled and uh, the third apparition happens after a couple of days. Now that second apparition was on uh, Quinquagesima Sunday and now we've gone through Shrove Monday, Shrove Tuesday, Ash Wednesday, and we come to the Thursday, the day after Ash Wednesday. Now, in the meantime, lots of talk at the school, and uh, a woman in the town who mar has married well. She's from among the poor folk, but she has married well. She was once a servant, and now she's a lady of means, and she talks to St. Bernadette's mother, and she wants Bernadette to come to her and to tell her the whole story. I, I'll send for Bernadette and question her to see if she is telling lies. Well, um, so this lady was suspicious but intrigued and she wanted to come with Bernadette the next time that she went to the grotto. And here we come to Thursday, February 18th. This is shortly after 5.30 a.m., very early in the morning, and this woman, Madame Millot, and her friend, another lady friend, came to the Subiru's door. Now, the mother had already gone off to do a day's washing, um, and Bernadette answered from within. 
She was not even up yet, but she dressed hurriedly and appeared in the doorway. The bell was ringing for the first mass, so they went straight to the church, and after hearing mass, they went out without a word into the fog. Madame Millot had a blessed candle, a sheet of white paper, and a pen and ink pot borrowed from her father's desk. On the way, she explained to her companions that she had provided herself with these articles in order to get the apparition to write down her wishes at Bernadette's request. Now, Madame Millot had thought that the lady appearing with the white dress, blue sash, and a rosary was the president of the Children of Mary, Elisa Larapi, who had died only a few months before. And she thought that this, uh, this deceased president of the Children of Mary was appearing and asking for prayers from purgatory, basically. And so she wanted, uh, so she brought along this paper so she could, you know, see if the apparition uh, would write down her wishes. Well, they, uh, they continued. Uh, we took the Massaviel Road, and at the beginning of the path that led to the grotto, Bernadette took the lead, and running, running along this slope, she disappeared like a flash of lightning. As for ourselves, we had to squat on our heels and got down there only with the greatest difficulty. How silent it was that morning in this wild glen. There was Bernadette on her knees between her two companions, Madame Millot on her right, and on her left, uh, Mademoiselle Perret, who lit the candle, the first that had ever shone in front of Massabiel, and placed it sheltered from the breeze against a rock. All three had taken out their rosary beads. Bernadette, with her eyes turned toward the Eglantine, had fallen into profound recollection. Suddenly she exclaimed, There she is! Be quiet! Madame Mio boldly ordered her, still incredulous and no doubt vexed at perceiving nothing. Let's say the rosary, suggested Mademoiselle Piret. Bernadette agreed. There was no apparent change in her. She was gazing at the apparition, and this time she did not seem to leave the earth in spirit. Externally, there was nothing in her features or in her eyes that indicated ecstasy. That morning, she was to be the intermediary between two worlds, and so for the intercommunication of one to the other, she was to remain free in her movements. She would act with perfect ease and lucidity, the opposite to hallucination, with its fixed stare and automaton's actions. As the rosary was not being recited in common, Antoinette Perret, her lips moving rapidly, was the first to finish the five decades. And she said, go and ask the lady what she wants. The child had not taken her eyes off the niche above the wild rose bush, and holding the ink pot, pen, and paper handed to her by Mademoiselle Perret, Bernadette Rose stepped forward and almost grazed the drooping branches of the eglantine, but suddenly she swerved and made toward the grotto. The two women guessed that she wanted to place the ink pot on the table-shaped stone that stood almost in the center. We were making ready to follow her, related Mademoiselle Perret, and we had already taken two or three steps behind her, when, without turning round, she made a sign to us with her right hand to retire, and we drew back behind the fold of the rock to the foot of the path where we knelt down. And from this position, as day was now breaking, they were still able to watch Bernadette. And Saint Bernadette was standing on tiptoe, holding out the pen and paper. Therefore, the lady must have graciously drawn nearer the child in order to be within easier reach. Bernadette stated afterward that she had spoken to the apparition, attested Antoinette Perret, but we did not hear her voice. The reason was that even in an incomplete ecstasy such as this one, Bernadette's voice did not reach the outside. At times, merely the movement of her lips was seen, yet freeing herself to be speaking, feeling herself to be speaking, she imagined she was heard by those present. I was speaking very loud just as now, she explained many times to such as questioned her about her conversations with the Lady of Massa Biel. And what had happened? Well, here's the explanation of Saint Bernadette herself. While I was moving forward, the lady drew back, as though retiring to her own private chamber, so that while placing my articles on the rock, I saw her in front of me. She made a sign that I was to stay, 
and that the others were to retire. Madame, I then said, would you be so kind as to write down your name? And for the first time, I heard her voice. But we understand, that, and she explained later, that she heard the voice here. So she heard it distinctly and clearly, but nobody else heard it. But it was like an inner locution. The apparition, therefore, did speak, and in the Lord's dialect, her reply was negative. At once, Bernadette went and communicated it to her two companions, for these women were thirsting to know, and they got up at her approach. She began to laugh, referring to the lady. Bernadette explained and said, there is no need to write down what I have to say. And so, what is it that she had to say? Well, standing in front of the boulder, Bernadette was listening again. For the second time, the very gentle voice spoke. Will you do me the favor of coming here for a fortnight? And Bernadette replied, after asking permission from my parents, I will come. Then to make it very clear to the little pauper girl of the Lord's dungeon that she would have to come with complete disinterestedness without hope of any human favor or of any vain fleeting worldly thought, but what was that for the devout child in comparison with a happiness unlimited and unending? The apparition added, I do not promise to make you happy in this world, but in the next. And with that, she rose toward the roof and disappeared. And there we have the third apparition. St. Bernadette remained very calm and at peace after that. Let us pray our prayer for day two of the Lord's Novena. Just a reminder that you can pray the prayers that are prayed every day on a separate video which says Lord's Novena Daily Prayers. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The second day. We have not here an abiding city, but seek one that is to come. Mary, this is the lesson we find so hard to learn. We know that one day this life with all its temptations and all its hardships will end. We realize, too, that Christ, your divine Son, has promised a reward exceeding great to those who, with resignation to his blessed will, bear the difficulties of life. But we are so weak. Too readily we succumb to temptation. Too easily we give in to discouragement. O oh, blessed lady, help us to be strong and to persevere in the love and friendship of God. Bolster up our wavering spirits whenever temptation threatens us. Encourage us whenever things go wrong. Lead us to Jesus, your divine Son, and make known to him our wants. And here, let us call to mind our intentions for this novena. And let us remember all those who are sick. St. Bernadette, you had trials and difficulties to endure here on earth, but in your troubles you relied upon the assistance of Jesus and Mary. Help us also to have faith and confidence in Christ and his Blessed Mother in all the trials and troubles of life. Ave, Ave, Ave Maria, Ave, Ave, Ave Maria. O Mary, our mother, we come to this place where you who are sinless appeared full of grace. Ave, Ave, Ave Maria, Ave, Ave, Ave Maria. As Bernadette waited, they came, there came to her sight a radiant lady surrounded by light. Ave, Ave, Ave Maria. Ave, Ave, 
Ave Maria. Join us tomorrow for day three in our novena in honor of Our Lady of Lourdes and St. Bernadette. Please subscribe to this video channel. If you like this video, share it with a friend and like it, and don't miss a day of prayer with us.